kingdom of Asante once ruled supreme in West Africa. It was a kingdom that became an empire. It played a pivotal role in commerce linking three continents, and it was built on slaves and gold. This is just a selection of the Asante crown jewels. It gives a real sense of the power and the sophistication of this kingdom. Africa's history isn't always revealed in written records. It's found instead in artifacts, culture, and the traditions of the people. We know less about Africa's distant past than almost anywhere else on Earth. But the history of this continent is as important and valuable as any other. In this series, I'm exploring some of the richest and most vibrant histories in the world. And I've come to Ghana in West Africa to explore the kingdom of Asante. It's just one of the continent's many historic and often overlooked kingdoms. Asante was among the most impressive. And it was found deep in the tropical forest, which raises some questions. How did a sophisticated society emerge from some of the toughest conditions on the planet? How was the Asante kingdom created? And what happened to it? Kumasi, Ghana's second city. Today it's home to one and a half million people. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Kumasi was the center of power of the Asante Kingdom. A British visitor named Thomas Bowditch came here in 1817. He wrote a remarkable account of the royal court he encountered. The king, his tributaries and captains were resplendent in the distance, surrounded by attendants of every description. At least a hundred umbrellas or canopies, which could shelter 30 persons, were sprung up and down by the bearers with brilliant effect, being made of the most showy cloths and silks and crowned on top with crescents, pelicans, elephants, barrels and arms and swords of gold. Wow, it, sound, it sounds quite something. Yes, and if uh, there's a pictorial depiction of this scene in, in this book itself, so I could show that to you. And Historian Mary Awusu is an expert an in the Asante Kingdom. Of, here it is. Luckily it's in colour, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly spectacular. Mm -hmm. And it, when one talks about kings and courts, you have a kind of certain idea of the extravagance and, and bright cloths and everything. And this fulfills all of that. And you can see, is this, is this figure here, is that the Asante that, that, that would be the Asante Hine, the king, yes. you see. And he has a lot more gold on him. And then the people. But that's also what power is about. It's about human beings, the number of people you control, as uh, well as having the wealth to go with that control. There's a real display of power. And I guess that the... The most significant sign of that is just how much gold is in evidence, just everywhere. It's pretty obvious looking at these, Mary, that they're trying to send a message. The Santini's right at the centre. The, the British you've come to visit, the, all of the, is different subjects, There's musicians. There's something you're, you're seeing but not seeing properly. What aren't I seeing? See these people here? Yes. They're holding skulls, oh, human skulls. Skulls of important individuals who have been overpowered to show how much control the king had. This illustration shows a wealthy state with an uncompromising grip on the kingdom. Fascinating though the account is, Bowditch only really got a snapshot of the Asante. And it doesn't reflect one of the most remarkable things about this kingdom, how it came into being in the first place. Asante emerged a little over 300 years ago in territory now occupied by the Republic of Ghana in the heart of West Africa's forest zone.
Dense forest is an unusual place for large civilizations to establish. The heat and humidity are relentless. Despite the conditions, a complex and sophisticated kingdom emerged here that dominated a vast area for more than 200 years. The vegetation seems so impenetrable that the scale of the achievement is hard to comprehend. Discovering how they did it and where they started has preoccupied historians for decades. In 2010, archaeology carried out by the University of Ghana made some important new discoveries about ancient life in this part of Africa. These are fire clay figurines we recovered from a site in northern Ghana, dating to the 9th and 10th centuries. Dr. Benjamin Kankpian and his colleagues found some 80 terracotta figures, perhaps a thousand years old, in savannah north of the forest, depicting animals and humans. He believes they were part of a shrine. What this points to is a very complex culture. I mean, even if you look at these as depictions of the world that surrounded the people who made them, that you can see that they're wearing jewellery, body adornment. Exactly. That this is obviously a very, very complex culture. Yeah, for sure. As far as we know, one of the markers of civilised society are ritual complexity, possibly marked by these. Uh, artistic figures, mm. quality ones mm. as well. The figurines indicate sophistication among the peoples who lived in this region of West Africa. But so far, archaeologists haven't proven any link between these objects and Asante. In fact, conclusive evidence has yet to be found of the precise origins of the Asante people, for good reason. It's challenging for archaeologists looking for ancient sites in this thick vegetation that thrives in heat and humidity. They simply don't know where the early Asante came from. The forest has yet to give up the physical evidence that might reveal what happened many centuries ago. Asante's history isn't as elusive as it might seem, however. Evidence does exist, but it appears in different forms, which are still incredibly valuable. Narrative, oral history, stories of the past, they're all important here. And knowing why is essential in understanding how the Asante kingdom came about and what held it together. These people, heading to the most hallowed spot in Asante territory. This is oral history in action. Their destination is a sacred site within a forest called Asante Manso, where a seldom held ceremony is taking place. It celebrates the seven clans who first established communities in the forest. And in so doing, laid the foundations of the Asante kingdom. According to legend, they emerged from holes in the ground within the forest. Sacrifice emphasizes the significance and rarity of the ritual. find it uncomfortable viewing, but it's an important part of the ceremony celebrating the origin of the Asante people. It doesn't really matter whether we believe that the Asante came from a hole in the ground or not. These myths are every bit as important today 
as they ever were. Many things decay in the heat and humidity of the forest, but folk memory lasts. Archaeologists can't be certain that Asante's ancestors came from exactly this spot, but the belief in forest origins does chime with what historians have established. The ancestors of Asante were Akan people whose language is still spoken. The Akan hunted and foraged for food around 600 years ago. But 300 years later, a sophisticated kingdom had emerged. In between, the Akan people and their environment went through a significant and rapid transformation. Before a community could establish itself in one place, a major obstacle had to be overcome. The forest. The original Sante, that they cleared this forest, trees of that size, by hand. During the peak of the forest clearance 500 years ago, the Akan used axes to weaken the trunks and then pulled the trees down with twine. Clearing the forest was a vital precondition for settled society. Before that, Akan people were part of a hunter gatherer society. With the forest cleared, agriculture could happen. Only with the space to cultivate land and grow food crops could groups of Akan people expand their populations. Today, in a forest in the west of Ghana, machinery makes short work of ancient trees. Hardwood timber, such as mahogany and teak, is among Ghana's most important exports. Licensing regulations attempt to protect the environment, but there's an understanding among forestry workers that Ghana's history is worth safeguarding too. The forest is important to, to the people, to the Akan. The forests are important, are they? Yes, it means something to the people. We have some areas we don't enter. He named the place, maybe this is the place where Asante people come from. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the forest is, a, is, a, is a very important to us. For the Akan people in the 15th and 16th centuries, forest clearance was mind-boggling work. Researchers have calculated that for one man to clear one hectare, it would take him 500 days to remove more than 1,200 tons of vegetation. And since the fertility of the soil deteriorates so quickly, he would have to rotate his crops, meaning he would need to clear six hectares to feed his family. Faced with such an enormous task, the Akan people needed additional labor. There weren't enough of their own people to do the job, so they used slaves. An expert in the early Akan societies that were the foundation of the Asante kingdom is Dr. Wilhelmina Donko. Yes, I mean, importing uh, people from outside was a really useful venture for them. Traders from outside coming in. At different times, they must have brought in people even from possibly as far afield as uh, maybe Nigeria, uh, the Senegambian areas, and, and so on. How did this early kind of slavery differ from transatlantic slavery, which comes slightly later? The system that operated here was quite different in the sense that unfree people or people of unfree descent could marry, uh, have offspring of their own could accumulate property and all that and sometimes they could even marry into 
the lineages of their, shall I say, the, their masters or the people who had initially procured them. So it wasn't very hostile. It did not uh, remove the basic humanity of those who had lost their freedom. But still, it's a loss of freedom in the sense that you were removed from your own kinsmen to join a different uh, set of people. With the help of unfree labor, the Akan made clearances in the forest on an unprecedented scale. For the first time, the forest was a viable place to have organized settled societies. It was still two or three hundred years before the Asante Kingdom, but this achievement had a long-lasting effect. The act of clearing the forest shaped a Can identity. There was a great sense of pride that this effort against the forest had been successful, but that only drove the imperative to do more. Farmers settled in the cleared areas and grew crops needed to support an expanding population. Today, cultivation still happens among the dense undergrowth. This is your farm, is this it? This is my farm. And could you tell me, um, what, what sort of um, produce do you farm here? Yeah, I do produce um, uh, uh, this type of food, which is plantain. Yeah. Uh, I planted this and it takes one year to harvest. This is called kukuyam. Yeah. And I planted kukuyam. It's like a potato, it's a starchy. Yeah, yeah it's starchy like potato. Yeah. How do you keep back all of the, the, the weeds and the big trees that seem to be growing so voraciously on the edge of your farm? We use this cutlass. Uh, so all of them will come once and weed everything. Having cleared space for agriculture, the ancestors of Asante were determined to make the most of it. The pursuit of abundance quickly became ingrained in the Akan cycle. The productiveness of the forest required a lot of hard work, much of it carried out by slaves. But none of that could have happened without a commodity that the Akan exchanged for slaves in the first place. Still found deep within the forest is the precious resource that paid for labor and transformed the Akan people. I'm on my way to one of the 10 largest gold mines in the world. This is the Abwasi gold mine. Today, gold-bearing rock is extracted from shafts that reach 1,500 meters underground. A chemical process separates the precious metal from the ore, and smelting results in gold bullion. The heat is so intense, I've never felt anything like it. It's unbelievable. Gold worth over £6 billion at today's prices has been extracted from here since the end of the 19th century. But it's been mined in this region for a lot longer than that. No one now knows when the Akan people discovered gold, but it is clear that they were mining it when they were clearing the forest in the 15th century. In those days, the gold was found much nearer the surface and it was smelted by the Akan using Iron Age technology. The precious resource was critical to the transformation of the forest and to the foundations of the Asante Kingdom. And gold provided by the forest gave the people a significant place in a much wider economy. Akan gold found its way to North Africa and beyond via Trans-Saharan trade routes. And gold paid for not just slaves, but textiles, brass, copper and salt. From the 1470s, Akan gold had a direct route to Europe 
via Portuguese merchants on the coast. In exchange for gold, they sold guns. A map made by a merchant in the 16th century shows who the Portuguese were dealing with. The most successful Akan were amassing power. The developing entrepreneurial spirit would have a major impact on culture in the Kingdom of Asante. The Akan businessmen had accumulated gold, slaves and land and they were known as Berempong, big men. And they shared one thing in common, one ultimate symbol of authority. It wasn't a crown or even gold regalia. It was a small wooden stool. The village of Awea is a center of stool craftsmanship. Every stool is carved from a single piece of sesse wood. The finest stools made here are used by senior figures in Ghanaian society. Less ornate stools are for everyday use and tourist souvenirs. According to leading Asante scholar, Professor Kwame Ahim, the stool was more than a seat to the Akan big men. It is a symbol of status. Now, uh, status in the sense of authority, power, um, um, and standing in society. And it begins with the uh, earliest village, you know, the family, uh, family unit. Uh, the eldest had to have a symbol of authority over everybody. So then he had a stool made for him. And why is the stool the symbol? And I suppose the, uh, the material used for it was durable. durable. Because he wanted it to last. Now, a stool is a way of remembering, or a, 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 a means of remembering. So, in a way, that these, that the stools actually became symbols of the history, that's and right. also, yeah, that's at right. the same time, they, of... they're symbols of office, symbols of authority, symbols of power, and also uh, reminders of their particular achievements. The experience of literally hacking their culture out of the forest was bound up in Akan stools. They helped to emphasize the roots of their organized society and much more. It's not just about rootedness. It's also about power, about lineage, about family. They actually had in the center of them an empty space where people could put things that they treasured that brought this object to life, made it more than just a seat. It became, in a way, a vessel that carried history. The stool's authority translated into political power for its chief. As the communities around each stool grew, they became less a collection of farmers and workers and more like highly centralized states. By the mid-1600s, dozens of independent village communities had turned into a patchwork of Akan states. The most powerful was Denchira. It controlled some of the richest gold mines in the forest. For decades, its neighbors sent tribute by way of slaves and other gifts to keep the peace. But Denchira's position as the most powerful of the Akan states was not to last. I'm on my way to the birthplace of the man who challenged Denchira and in the process, founded the Asante Kingdom. Dentira's demands on its neighbors left it with few friends and many enemies. In 1701, an alliance of states defeated Dentira in battle. The leader of the alliance was Osai Tutu, the first Asantehini, or king of Asante. According to legend, the village of Anina is where it all started. This is a beautiful place. I've been offered a guided tour by the chief of the nearby town. This place is particularly special, though, isn't it? The speciality came as a result of the birth of Osaitutu, which happened here. So Osaitutu was born here. Let us go to the house. 
Ossai Tutu is thought to have been born sometime during the 1640s. There are very few certainties known about him, but I find it peculiar that there aren't even many artistic impressions of what he might have looked like. The chief is taking me to see one of the very few. And this is where the woman was always sitting down to take care of the child after washing the child. And this, has... this little shrine shows an infant Osai Tutu in his mother's arms. It doesn't give much of an idea of what the man was like. What kind of person was he? He was a mysterious man, a warrior, <laughs> a builder, who was able to establish a kingdom. In fact, <laughs> if, if we, we would not be blasphemy, he was our Christ, who gave us the freedom, gave us the art of kinship. And he managed to put us together. The sculpture's strikingly Western in its appearance. And I think the use of Christian iconography is deliberate. If Osai Tutu is to be remembered as a messiah, it makes sense in this now very Christian country to remind people of Mary and Jesus. I was keen to see the place where, according to legend, Osai Tutu's mother gave birth. Those who are qualified to go there are going to go barefooted. It's in a wooded area, just outside the village. We shall go to the spot. I, I would yes. love to. Yes. So that is a place. But before, well, as soon as we get to this point... I have to take my shoes off. Yeah, we, we, we. I'm not sure we shall go there. No, no, no. no, no. Uh, uh, we have to take permission from... Unfortunately, the site is regarded as so sacred, not even the chief has the authority to cross its boundary. There's genuine reverence for the stories of the past, whether provable or not. Can I ask you about the importance of history to the Asante people? People who, are, who don't know their history just move about like uh, ordinary chaff which is being blown by the, uh, with the wind. But those who know their history try to keep the pride that the great ancestors created for them. If we want to maintain our status, maintain our stature, we need to have background of what happened in the, in the past and try not to go away from it, maintain it. It need, need be modify it to suit conditions as prevailing presently. The notion of modifying history to suit the present is an intriguing idea, but not a new one. It's exactly what happened when the Asante Kingdom was created over 300 years ago, an event commemorated in its capital, Kumasi. This was the seat of Osai Tutu's power, and it's where a particular reading of the history is displayed. This modern statue commemorates the most significant and legendary moment in the creation of Asante. The figure isn't Osai Tutu, but his advisor, Akomfo Anoche. He's seen summoning a golden stool down from the heavens. According to folklore, the golden stool is the spirit of the Asante nation. When Akomfo Anoche summoned it from the sky, it settled gently on Osai Tutu's knees anointing him the great leader of the Asante kingdom. The Confo Noche was Merlin to Osai Tutu's King Arthur. Historians aren't even certain that he ever existed, but by promoting the myth, the Asante state deliberately mixed belief with fact. The golden stool gave Osai Tutu spiritual power to bolster the military leadership he'd already shown. The golden stool was displayed periodically to reinforce the legend. The rarity of its public appearances adds to its mystique. The faith in the stool's supernatural origins gave its own authority and gave the Asante people a strong sense of belonging. Nothing lasts forever in the forest, even kings. But if the golden stool contained the spirit of the Asante nation, 
then the kingdom could last forever. Asante royalty followed the ancient Akan tradition of succession on the mother's line. With the spiritual authority of the golden stool and with the help of European firearms, Osai Tutu and his successors embarked on campaigns of expansion. Drums were vital to the kingdom's ambitions. Long distance communication meant Asante's imperialism could be fast and effective. These are the Atampan drums, the talking drums of Asante. They're a means of communication, but perhaps not in the way you might imagine. These drums don't just beat out a rhythm, they speak. And if you know the language, you can hear words and phrases. That was great. Thank you so much. That was, it's just amazing. And just to hear, you don't just hear it, you feel it. It's absolutely wonderful. So each one of these drums have a different sound, a different function. Is that right? Yes, this one is to get an idea of drum language, I've come to speak to drum maker James Chompong. And these drums speak, is that right? Yes. How, how do they actually communicate? I'm fascinated by that. There are certain uh, basic uh, drum language which is very familiar to anybody within the community. Uh, such like maybe we are going to war, some one have lost at the forest, and yeah, we are going to communal labor. The king is calling everyone have to come report to, at the palace. Th th that's uh, the basic thing. Everyone within the community uh, knows that. Drum language is possible because it doesn't simply imitate the syllables of spoken words, but their tone as well. Thanks to the combinations of sounds the drums can produce. I see. So together, that they make a full sound. If you hear a rhythm, I can call you. You can call me? Yeah. yeah. If you, what is your name? My name. Yeah. My name is Gus. How would you do that? How would you call me? I should yeah. call you. Amata, you call me. Amata. I'm not, I don't, I, I apologise for my stupidity, but I don't, I can't see the relationship. Do Gus again. No, no, no. Do Gus again, please. Do Gus, Gus. Come. Atta Junior, come. The talking drum in the olden days was the only means to communicate from a village to other village. So there was no telephone then. So normally the community used the talking drum to, uh, to send messages from village to other village. You kill thousand, thousand will come. So that, that's the great... Asante saying, isn't it? Asante Kotoko. So that one saying, when you kill a thousand, yeah. a thousand will come. Yeah. The common language of the region made this form of communication extremely effective. Asante had no standing army. Instead, every village was expected to contribute soldiers to campaigns ordered by the Santehini. The reservists responded to the drummer's call to war, and the kingdom expanded rapidly in the first half of the 18th century. Asante soon dominated territory that stretched beyond the borders of modern Ghana. Previously independent states were coerced into a federation with power centralized in Kumasi. States were either forcibly conquered or submitted to Asante's power. They became provinces of the kingdom. Their chiefs became vassals of the Asante king, 
the Santa Haven. As the kingdom expanded, the Santee grew rich from the proceeds of warfare. The wars of expansion resulted in the accumulation of vast numbers of slaves, far more than they could possibly use. But this also raised an opportunity. 110 miles south of Kumasi is Ghana's coast, and a poignant reminder of African history. After the Portuguese began trading in the 1470s, other Europeans followed to what became known as the Gold Coast. Cape Coast Castle was originally a base for Swedish merchants, but by the mid-1660s, it had been taken over by the British. As Asante rose to prominence, the white men were less interested in gold than in another valuable commodity, labor. The Asante captured slaves in the interior and sold them to the British and other European powers. Gold had once connected the Akan to the economies of Europe. Now slavery entwined West Africa in a system that linked it to Europe and the Americas. More than a million Africans were sold off of this coast to a life of slavery in the New World. And they were captured and sold by their fellow Africans. The institution of slavery had been part of the economic normality of West Africa for hundreds of years. Selling slaves to Europeans for use in the Americas was a lucrative new business, not exclusive to the Asante, but used by them for their own advantage. Dr. Kwabina Adebwaini is an expert on the Asante and the slave trade. After it had been established as a kingdom, you know, for economic reasons and for other reasons, Asante began to expand beyond the boundaries of the core kingdom. And that is where the issue of acquiring slaves for sale came in. Under normal circumstances, you, you, when you are fighting, you, you kill your enemies. You see, but the slave trade had already emerged as an economic system. So as Asante was expanding, it was, it was getting a lot of war captives. And constant warfare meant constant production of war captives. And once there was a market existing on the coast, you know, logically and rationally, these had to be disposed. And that was going to make them rich. So it's a formidable model that they expand, they capture more, they people. Capture more people. Those people are then sold yeah, as so slaves, which then feeds the economy, feeds allows the economy. them to expand even more. Expand even more. Yeah. Acquire the instruments for the expansion, that is, firearms. And can I ask you a a very 21st century question. How did the Asante deal with the morality of slavery, of selling human beings? We, in the 21st century, look back and look at it from the moral perspective. But then, morality was not, was not too important. It was business. It was business of the day. And the resources were organized, you know, and invested in that business. So, yes, in our time, it was immoral. It was, it's a terrible kind of situation in our thinking and in our estimation. But at that time, I don't think morality was, was a factor at all. It didn't work. For many years in Africa and Europe, slavery was simply a means to an end. Just as their Akan ancestors had used unfree labor to make clearings in the forest, the Asante kings used the proceeds of slavery to create a powerful kingdom. But having created an empire of provinces, the Asantehinis all faced a major challenge, how to keep them together. The Asante kings recognized the value of a traditional culture of storytelling. They understood that the old ways of recording history could be made to work for them. In the heart of the historic kingdom is evidence to show how the Asante state deliberately created a sense of nationalism. Surrounding Kumasi, communities developed a range of skills and crafts, places like this, Bonwiri, 
They may not have been big or powerful, but they played a crucial role in binding the kingdom of Asante together. I've come here to see Kente, Ghana's famous patterned cloth. To many people, this is simply brightly coloured material used to make clothes. But there's a lot more to it than that. What's amazing about Kente cloth is every single one of these patterns has a different meaning. And these are meanings that are used to weave the Asante community together. Even the textile itself is symbolic, made by joining individual strips of material. The word kente means whatever happens to it, it will not tear. And each pattern represents a proverb. We call this my heart desire. My heart's desire? Yeah, my heart desire. I'm like Isaac, one of the weavers of the workshop, is showing me how messages can be found in the material. Many of them reinforcing a single basic idea we're better together than apart. The black is our color. This is um, family is unity. You know, um, the Sante people, the king said that we should unite together. He said that we united, we stand divided before. So he named this particular club that family is unity. That's so there's a kind of a sense of narrative that you... Yes. That's the Ashanti people, we should unite together so that we can fight with our enemies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And is there a particular reason that the colors Yes. They have particular meanings in particular configurations. Um, the yellow. Do you see um, Africa? We have gold. So the yellow color over here represents the gold that we have, that is natural resources. Yes, we have gold. And the black is the, our color. You see, yes. And then the, the green over here, that the, the forestry that we have. We have a big forest, yes. And then the blue is the sky. Mm -hmm. So all the colors also mean something. I see. I mean, I can understand how those tones that they weave together a sense of community but also as you say that each one of these they represent something something within the environment it's wonderful kente rich with symbolism was promoted by the santahinas by wearing the cloth of bomwire the monarch recognized the contribution of bomwire's craftsmen to the santi kingdom while also advertising the kingdom's benefits I know these objects, but only from a distance, really. But to see them up close, you can see why the Asantehini wanted to invest in them. He wanted them to be a metaphor for the Asante nation. And he chose alongside them drums. He chose gold. He chose a variety of different kinds of crafts that would bind the Asante together. The people were proud to see their traditions being used by the king. But the state's appropriation of local customs revealed how determined it was to shape the kingdom as it saw fit. The Asante nation wasn't just about weaving peoples together. Whilst there was consent, there was also control. In a hundred years, the kingdom had grown significantly. At its largest extent in the early 1800s, it included outlying provinces as far as 16 days' journey from Kumasi. Its population was over 2 million, 20 times more than South Africa in the same period. A kingdom of this size required careful government. I'd been given permission to enter the royal palace in Kumasi and to see some of the instruments of control used by the state at the height of its power. The original palace was the centre of Asante government. From Kumasi, civil servants were sent all over the kingdom to implement its policies and to apply its laws. I've arrived just as the palace gun bearers have come to remove historic weapons from the museum. So you carry the guns during ceremonies? Yeah, and during the, 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 the sitting of the of the king. Anytime the king sits the sit in state. The guns and the sword has to come out to signify that there's the king. So who, who did that belong to? That is the, the, the first king of Ashanti, Otunfo or Say Tutu the first. Oh, really? Yes. This is outside Tutu's gun. Wow, amazing. 
European firearms had been instrumental in creating and expanding the Asante Kingdom during the 1700s. Threat of force was one way the kingdom maintained control, but other methods were just as effective. The royal palace once housed the most important part of the kingdom's bureaucracy, the treasury. Since gold was first mined in the forest, the currency of this area of West Africa was gold dust. Scales and counterweights were used for precise measurements. Even gold nuggets and ingots were smelted down and turned into gold dust so they could be accurately measured. Every transaction was in gold dust, including taxation. Look at that exquisite little object, tiny little stool. It's actually a gold weight. You can imagine them weighing gold against something like this. It's an indication of just how important taxation and financial control actually was. And the treasury, it was a mechanism for administering all of the Asante bureaucracy. It's just another one of those institutions that was core to consolidating Asante power. Taxation didn't simply fund the government. It ensured that no individual could become significantly wealthy. Gold was not just money. It was power. And it was vital that power was held by the state. The regalia of the Santahini had to be the very best. And the quality is just mind-blowing, exquisite work. Ostentatious demonstrations of wealth by the king reminded everyone of their history, of how the gold found in the forest had been instrumental in creating the kingdom. The Asante people had long accepted that the kingdom was safeguarded if the state was rich. But those assumptions were to be severely challenged. Asante had become wealthy and powerful, in part because of the trade in slaves with Europeans on the coast, a trade controlled by the state. But in 1807, the slave trade was abolished in the British Empire, with far-reaching consequences for the Asante. The economy shifted, and the state's control over it weakened. People began to trade in new things with the British on the coast and with traders from across the desert. The people of Asante had always believed in the state's control over wealth. But now they were increasingly in contact with people from beyond the kingdom who were making money for themselves. Many abandoned Kumasi and migrated to the southern provinces for a piece of the action. Their ancestral entrepreneurial spirit reawakened. At the same time, the sudden drop in European demand for slaves meant that all goods had to be paid for in gold dust it rapidly became scarce. These new influences had a profound effect. People started hoarding gold. They buried it to avoid paying tax. This was a direct assault on the power of the Asante state. These internal problems plagued the kingdom in the first half of the 19th century. And they were made worse by a fractious relationship with an international trading partner. The military museum in Kumasi was built as a fort by the British. This collection of photographs is testament to British involvement here from the late 19th century. But the British influence on the coast had been growing steadily for many decades before then. There were disagreements and outbreaks of hostilities between the British and Asante, but for the most part, relations between them were of two cooperative trading states. But then, in the late 1860s, everything changed. Asante wanted to restore its domination over its southern provinces to tighten its grip on coastal trade. But some of those provinces had turned to the British for protection. 
and an Asante trade monopoly was not in British commercial interests. The two powers were on a collision course. As tempers flared, the Asante took a number of Europeans as prisoners, an act that the British would cite as a justification for war. A war that would allow the British to consolidate their trading position on the coast. In February 1874, British forces marched into Kumasi, the first foreign troops to do so. They burned it to the ground, then returned to their base on the coast. The destruction of Kumasi was a shock to this previously undefeated kingdom. But the impact was more than psychological. As Kumasi lay in ruins, Asante was forced to accept the loss of its southern provinces. In August 1874, they became the British Gold Coast. A hundred years after Asante's empire building, the Europeans were gaining foreign lands. The authority of the Asante Kingdom had failed to withstand the challenges of the British or the changing economic realities affecting its people. The kingdom's other provinces began asserting their power, and in the 1880s, civil war threatened to tear Asante apart. The violence ended in 1888, when the factions agreed to a new Asantehini, a 16-year-old named Prempe I. Professor Irene Nadote has explored his effect on a kingdom on the verge of destruction. So here was this young man, having come to power, uh, the question was, how was he going to manage? Manage to bring all these forces, the insiders who defected and all these other people, bringing them together to build a strong Asante nation once more. That was his challenge, peaceful Asante nation. So what he did was to re-establish the importance of the golden stool as a unifying factor for the Asantes. So the golden stool, it's, it's the rallying point for the whole nation. Yes, but at that time, we're talking about the British too, also saying, hey, wait a minute, if this man succeeds in reuniting Asante to make a strong Asante nation, we will be in trouble because that's the last thing we want. Because the British were determined now to get hold of Asante and make Asante a colony. So uh, the governor comes to Kumasi, and when he came to Kumasi, now he made demands on Prempe the first. I think by the time the British came to make their demands, he had decided that I'm not going to fight any more wars. Let me see if I can compromise. If I compromise, one, I will save my nation, my, my nation, and also probably I will save myself. So that was the thing. But the British were so determined, so in spite of all that, they decided that, hey, we are taking you and your mother and some of the chiefs, and then send them to Sierra Leone for three years, and from there, send them to the Seychelles Island. The enforced exile of Prempe in 1896 stopped the kingdom's resurgence in its tracks. Six years later, Asante was formally incorporated into the British Gold Coast colony. The Asante Kingdom had been the result of centuries of Akan state building in the forest. Asante's pivotal position in an international economy had brought it wealth and power. In the final years of the 19th century, weakness and instability had allowed Britain to add Asante to its African possessions. The Asante Kingdom was crushed. The British sought out the last symbols of independence to be destroyed, but something, something subtle, survived. The British had failed to destroy the spirit of the Asante nation, or its physical embodiment, the Golden Stool. It was a significant error, as palace historian Osai Kwadwo explained. Our spirit, our everything is in the golden stool. So that when even the British tried to take the golden stool away, 
we did our best to hide it and they never saw it. So they later found that it was not the occupant of the stool who mattered. Because we fought so that they could not take the golden stool away and they never saw the golden stool. So to us, I say we were victorious. <laughs> In 1924, Prempe was allowed to return from exile. The golden stool reappeared at the royal palace. The kingdom was restored after Ghana gained independence in 1957, and the Sante's traditional festivals were revived. The Aquaside festivals held every 42 days. It remembers the ancestors and celebrates the history of the kingdom. The same things that were used to bind the kingdom together 300 years ago are everywhere. The gold that was once mined deep in the forest. The drums that beat out the proverbs of Asante. The kente cloth that carries the slogans of unity. All in stunning display. Do you understand why they chose gold? In this life with the kente, it just looks extraordinary. No, no, no. These symbols of power. No, no, no. no. Suddenly you understand them. They're just dazzling in this life. Provincial chiefs gather to pay homage to the current of Santahini, Osai Tutu II. He may not command an army or wield the power of his ancestors. There's no doubt about his importance to the Asante people. It's amazing to get this close to the king of Ashanti, wearing all of that gold, that kente, the story that we try to tell, alive and well in this man, the embodiment of our story. This is a celebration of history, but it's history with a purpose. We dwell upon our uh, history to improve upon our future. That's why our history is very important for us. And so for the future, do you feel that the kingdom is in good health? Yes. One thing I see is that our people are proud to keep the culture. And we are Asantes because of our culture. <laughs> the Asante state once used mythology and traditions to assert its origins, reinterpret history, and forge a kingdom. Now, these festivals use history to maintain the Santa's identity and its people's sense of belonging within the Republic of Ghana. I came in search of a lost kingdom, but I found a kingdom which is very much alive, which still finds a coherence around those central core things that were set up by Osai Tutu with the foundation of this empire. Gold, kente, drumming, the stool, they still work for the Asante people as much today as they ever did. And brand new Lost Kingdoms of Africa continues here on BBC4 at the same time next Monday. Next tonight, though, back to the wall with Only Connect.